My name is John Cowsell, and I've been a Vader artist for since 2000. I'm going to give you a brief history that will only take an hour. I was once a child star. I was not born a child star. I worked towards it. No, seriously, um, I was in a band called the Cow Sills that was formed in 1963. Used to sing around a table with my brothers, sang a lot of folk songs. Um, we had hits. 1967 was our first big hit, which was Rain in the Park and Other Things. We had a top 40 hit with We Can Fly, and we had a top 20 hit with Indian Lake, and then we had a, our biggest hit was a song called Hair from the Broadway musical. Um, we wish we had written it, we did not, we only performed it, but um, that, that, that was that, but before that, um, I think I was seven when I started playing drums, and uh, the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan. And, and that's what started it for me. Ringo was my hero. And so uh, we would go in a back room and pretend with air drums, you know, oatmeal boxes and stuff. And, but I would be playing a piano, not a drum. My brother Barry was the first drummer. But then soon uh, the Beatles did come out and we needed a bass guitar at that point. So I became the drummer. Um, I didn't, it, I used to play in a dark room with an amplifier fender red light on. and. Uh, I learned in the dark to play drums, so if I see the drums, I, I miss them. So I'm usually looking at you or my microphone. But um, I started when I was seven. Um, shortly after probably about six months of playing in that band, we played a couple of carnivals. Um, we got a job at a bar playing four sets a night. Um, that didn't go over well at seven years old the very first night, so the cops had raided the place. Um, it was called the Muchinger King Discotheque and it was a wine cellar. Uh, we talked to the mayor because it was a very small town. I come from Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, they said it was okay that a seven-year-old plays the bar as long as he's not drinking and he's not sitting in the bar area. Go figure, you can't do that today, kids. Um, we would play this bar all the time. And people in, come to Newport, Rhode Island to vacation, you know, rich people who live on the outside areas. And um, they would come and they would come to the clubs in the summertime. And there were some people from the Today Show there. And they put us on TV, uh, asked us if we want to be on TV because they thought it was phenomenal such little kids could play their instruments. I don't know how good we were, but we were working. Um, and that kind of started it. Then uh, a guy named Johnny Nash saw us on that show, and I don't know how they contacted him because I was seven. I didn't really pay attention to the logistics of the business. But um, we ended up on a, our first record label was Joda Records. And uh, we were an R&B band. Beatles, Stones, but with this record company, we were doing R&B because Johnny had a lot of songs he written. And uh, I mean, they had songs like, You can't go halfway, you got to go all the way to have my love. You no, know, and he was like into this, digga, 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 digga. That's what he would say, so I always thought that was cool. And uh, those were my first sessions I played on. And, and just as of recently, I can't say where I got them, but I just got the masters to that. Um, I have the original 19 tracks we did in 1960, late four, early five, and uh, literally got them three days ago. I don't know when this is going to date, but anyway, it's really cool. But then we went to Mercury from there, and uh, they thought we were a cute little band. Look at the little little boys and their older brothers. It's a family, so let's uh, let's give them some cute music. So they gave us songs like. We went from R&B to this ridiculously kitty thing. Uh, I love my Siamese cat because she's not very fat. She leaps through the air and lands in the chair. I know I couldn't do that, so I hate my Siamese cat. Anyway, cute I guess, but uh, don't put your feet in the lemonade. We're running out of water. Go soak your car in some ginger ale, though it may get sticky, sorta. So that's what they were giving us at Mercury. We met a guy named Artie Kornfeld there who is watching this horrific thing go down and uh, he said do we want to get out of there and we said yeah and he took us and financed the first recording we did for MGM as an independent producer he wrote the first hit for us Rain the Park and other things with a guy named Steve Duboff and took us to Lenny Stolo we signed with the management company that afternoon we had an MGM contract and we put a record out and we toured and it was a big hit and we wrote it for a little while but we wanted, they put, MGM put my mother and my sister in the band when we signed with them and that was, 
It was okay for me because I was little. I didn't. It didn't really affect me yet. But um, my older brothers who wanted the Beatle, be the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, it put a damper on it definitely to have my mom in the band. And my dad managed it. And he was like Joe Jackson, you know, all those bad dads who managed family bands. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. So we rode fame for a while till around 1972, and then we uh, slowly rode down the hill. People were asking us on the way down, hey, I've got a great hit song for you kids to record. It's called Ooh Weep, Chirpy Chirpy Cheep Cheep. Bye, we keep going, not interested. So we were really done with being the Kausos, the that family band. And uh, although I look back now, it's very endearing, but man, during that time, being the age we were, and, and then uh, we disbanded. We actually called, a. there were three of us left, my brother Bob and Barry and myself. and. Uh, I remember we were in a hotel room and we, we scared to, just scared to death of my dad. But we said, if we band together, you know, we'll all be okay. And so we uh, called him into our hotel room. We were in Texas somewhere. We said, we want it to end. We want to, we want to break up the cows. And we thought he was just, you know, going to start throwing and beating us up. And, but he didn't do that. He, uh, he got worried. And he says, look, guys, all I need is, you know, all I need is, Two more years, we'll be back on top. <laughs> and we said, no. I mean, we were wearing tuxedos. We s weren't even doing our own songs. We were still being a cover band live. Look at a cow so live in concert album. It's Good Vibrations, Monday, Monday, Walk Away Renee, Paperback Writer, Act Naturally, Sunshine of Your Love. I mean, that's what was on our live in concert album. And we put hair on it to sell it, you know. And, you know, we were good. We did the songs good. But um, it was just a weird thing that it ended up being in my... Dad kept us in these tuxedos, and it was just like, we didn't want to be that. So we broke up, and then time went by. I never knew how to get a gig, because I always had a gig, so if my phone didn't ring, I wasn't working, so um, I was not into starving, so I kept shampoo bottles at Nature's Gate Herbal Cosmetics for $2.50 an hour. That was kind of cool. Um, met nice people. I'm never afraid of hard work, so I was good to go. Um, I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know how to get a gig, you know. Um, I, I think I had one band after the Cow Seals, after nine months of we broke up and I moved back east. I was living in California at the time. I'm from Newport, Rhode Island. So I moved back over here and I joined a band in, uh, must have been 72, 73, called Grease the Cat. <laughs> and you know, another cover band. We played up and down New England coast and uh, it was during the kind of glitter rock thing, so we were like all kind of decked out, kind of cool. And it, and it was cool for me because I'd never played with another band in my life. Okay, I just played with my family. So, and you know, there was a lot of sibling stuff and your time's shitty and your this is that, and you know, hey, don't do that, you know. So I was like in, in a band where they actually people were saying, well, man, this is cool, we have John Capsule in our band, you know. And uh, I don't use that name often because it was almost embarrassing to use it because we were embarrassed. I'm okay now. Um, but, uh, and if you did use your name, they said, uh, no, you're from that family band, right? <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, we got Ricky Pitar, you know. Um, but that was a cool band, and we did a lot of um, Led Zeppelin stuff, which I just love Led Zeppelin. We did ZZ Top, old ZZ Top. We did Flash, who was pre-Yes, so we were doing some prog back then. Um, that was fun for me, and I didn't sing. I said, no, I'm not singing. Because I sing all the time when I play, which I'm glad I know how to do, and, and that's why I get hired now. But, um, but then it was like the first band I could just play drums, and what a difference to be able to like move away from the microphone because they didn't have headset microphones then. So you know, it's like you're always like this, or you're like this, and you're doing this, and um, if you sing backgrounds a lot, then that's where you are. So that was my first time I didn't have that, and it was strange. I, I, I prefer to sing and play now. But after that, um, I got a call from my brother Paul who was working for Helen Reddy at the time. So this is 1973 or so. And, uh, <laughs> and he called us up, he got a deal with Capital because Helen was on Capital. And my brother Bill and he were partners on this project. And I got a call from my dad who had, you know, called me up, he says, hey, I think your brother Paul needs you. So I called my brother Paul up and um, he said, hey man, why don't you come back to California? I got this band called Bridie Murphy put together and I got a capital deal. I went, oh my God, great, big time again, here we go, yeah, get me out of the bar. So uh, I fly out to California, 
you know, and God bless my brother Bill, but man, I show up there, you know, he's got the blue bottle of ice smearing off in his back pocket and everybody's, it's like, it's like if you've ever seen the movie Apocalypse Now, when they get to the end of the trail and they, the guy asks, where's the CEO? And the place is like fireworks and everybody's high and drunk and, you know, get me some more blow, you know, and um, that's what I walked into and, uh, you know, I had a, an, an odd relationship with my oldest brother Bill who I always wanted his approval as a drummer because you know I was growing up they had to put up with me I don't know how if I was any good or not but um, but but you know he says come on man you know my meter wasn't great as a kid you know I'm going through puberty now and it's like even worse now because I'm thinking too much and uh, uh, and and Wadi Wachtel also a friend who was always involved with us. I've known Wadi since I was seven, anybody who knows him. Anyway, so he was in on this Bridie Murphy project as well. And uh, so I was already scared to play with them because last time I played with them, it was a f mess. You know, that's what I heard. So, <laughs> so those guys, I always wanted their approval. Um, so now I'm, I'm going into the studio with these guys and uh, we're rehearsing, trying to hire other people. So we had uh, Lindsey Buckingham and, and was going to come and also be in Bridie Murphy. I think he was in for like three days or something. And uh, Waddy whispered to him, he says, get out of here while you can. <laughs> it was a runaway train. Yeah, we had a, we had a release on, uh, on Capitol. No, no, it didn't get released. It got shelved. John Carter was the in-house producer there and it got shelved. Anyway, after that, uh, that disbanded. Worked with Bob Crew on a couple of things, trying to put a band together with just Paul, me, and Susan. Bob was now out. Um, and we just drifted, and I drifted for a long time, and I should have been playing drums in a band, and I didn't. I was trying to coattail on everybody else. Hey, you need me? Hey, you need me? What do you need? You know, so. Oh my God, the story goes on. And so then I was a regular worker, did some stuff. Oh my God, I can't put this all together. Um, just let's skip my 13 hot year hiatus of playing on the road or anything. I was just in a marriage, had two wonderful kids. Um, I've been married two times. I'm married now. Still have two beautiful kids, but a, a wife who we really get along with. Um, her name is Vicki Peterson. She's in the Dangles. Maybe you know that. So then this, the late 70s, um, Bob, Paul, and Susan and I decided we want to get together again. I don't know why we kept doing it. Bob wrote a batch of songs and said, hey man, we need to record these things. So we do that. So um, we're friends with Jackson Brown and Jackson took us to a guy named Chuck Plotkin who produced um, Bruce Springsteen's The River, uh, Darkness on the Edge of Town. Really started with Bruce as a mixer, but anyway, he had a studio called Clover Studios. He took us on as his private project. And we worked with Chuck Plotkin for about five years in Los Angeles at his studio called Clover Studios where it was like my second home. And uh, we recorded a lot of stuff. Um, Chuck helped us out a lot. We sang on Harry Chapin's last album there. I sang on Bette Midler's No Frill album. Uh, I played and sang on Tommy Two Tones, 8675309. Actually, we don't know the exact drummer because there were several who played on it and it's got like a lot of splices on it. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, have to give me some kind of sign. 